good afternoon and maybe good early morning to anyone who may be listening uh, from Korea uh, or in Asia. So it's a lunch time uh, here at Stanford. I'm uh, skipping my lunch uh, for this talk. So hopefully uh, you can enjoy uh, this conversation. So I'm Gi Yuk Shin, uh, Director of the Schoenstein uh, Asia Pacific Center here at Stanford. Also, I lead uh, Korea program. So, on behalf of the Center and also Center for Strategic and International Studies, I'd like to welcome all of you to this book launch event uh, for our uh, volume, The North Korean Conundrum uh, Balancing Human Rights and Nuclear Security. So, this book uh, is a collection of papers that the World Force presented virtually in June of last year at our center, uh, it was a 12th annual uh, great workshop. So the papers in this volume uh, represent the work of international experts, uh, scholars, and practitioners. They explore the political issues that intersect with how we address the North Korean uh, human rights problem. Okay, these range from inter-Korean relations to international cooperation, okay, law of United Nations, and denuclearization to information flows into North Korea. So as you know, these topics continue to be important, uh, perhaps more important now in light of North Korea's response to COVID-19 as the DPRK has tightened restrictions on its borders, resulting in reduced trade and worsening the economic and social situation of its population. So we hope today's presentation and discussion will provide a taste of some of the topics covered in this book, uh, which will be available uh, fairly soon. Okay, now I'll introduce our speaker's uh, lineup for today's event, uh, which includes my co-editor uh, for the book, uh, Ambassador Bob King, and two authors of our volume, uh, Ned Kretchen and uh, Victor Cha. So as you know, uh, Bob King uh, served as the US Special Envoy for North Korean uh, human rights issues at the State Department from 2009 to 2018. Uh, actually, so far, he was the only special envoy uh, for this position, and I hope that uh, we can fill in uh, the next one uh, fairly soon. So he's now senior advisor to uh, Korea chair at CSIS and senior fellow at the Korea Economic Institute and board members of Committee for uh, Human Rights uh, in North Korea. So Bob was actually a 2019-2020 Korea Fellow at our center for the fall quarter uh, at Stanford. Gennett okay, uh, Kretchen is Vice President for Programs at the Open Technology Fund, a congressionally funded NGO that supports the development and deployment of anti-censorship, privacy, and security technologies for populations living under repressive information censorship regimes. The last but not least, uh, Victor Cha is a senior vice president and Korea chair at CSIS and vice dean for faculty and graduate affairs and professor of government at Georgetown University. So he served as a director of for Asian affairs at NSC uh, from 2004 2007, and was also the deputy head of delegation for United States at the six party talks uh, in Beijing. And Victor was also uh, 2019, uh, 2020 Korea Fellow uh, for the center, uh, for the winter quarter at our center at Stanford. And we really appreciate uh, your you know, help and support uh, to co sponsor uh, this book uh, launch event uh, in a, today. Okay, so today uh, each of our panelists will be speaking for about 10 minutes, uh, and then uh, I'll lead some conversation uh, among us, and then take some questions uh, from the audience. 
So if you have any question, uh, please submit uh, your questions uh, through ask button uh, on the event page. Okay, once again, uh, thanks for joining us and hopefully you'll enjoy a uh, conversation on this uh, very important topic. So without further ado, uh, let me talk, turn to you know, Bob, uh, Ambassador King. Thanks very much, Victor. Thank you for the uh, fellowship, uh, the uh, correct uh, uh, fellow appointment, which allowed me to spend some time working on North Korean human rights issues uh, when I wasn't tied up with the day-to-day -day mechanics of doing it when I was the special envoy. Uh, and thanks also to Victor for uh, co-hosting this event to talk about the uh, North Korea conundrum, uh, which is uh, will be out within the next week or so. Um, Nat has been uh, a good help and support in terms of dealing with North Korean issues for a long time. And it's great to have this group of people to talk about some of the issues that uh, that were ra that are raised in this uh, the book that's being published. Uh, this is uh, the book was an outgrowth of a conference uh, held uh, that focused on North Korea human rights issues and and related uh, issues. Uh, and the idea behind this was to look at the question of the relationship between security issues and human rights issues. Uh, this conundrum that, that we talk about in the title is, is this interaction between security and human rights. And is there a trade-off? Uh, is uh, If we focus on human rights, does that make it more difficult for us to deal with, uh, with the security issues? If we focus on security issues, do we have to ignore human rights? Uh, the, the argument that we'd like to make is that, in fact, uh, as Victor phrases it in his essay, this is a, not a zero-sum game. Uh, it isn't, uh, if you make progress on human rights, you have to give up on security, or if you make progress on security, you have to give up on human rights. Uh, the argument is that the two are interrelated and that we can come up with better solutions if we can work on both issues at the same time, uh, if we can walk and chew gum at the same time. Um, one of the things that's very clear is that North Korea's record on human rights is, is one of the worst. It's a rogue nation on uh, because of its nuclear weapons and missile programs, but at the same time, it has one of the worst records in the world in terms of its record on human rights. Uh, periodic reports that rate uh, countries on their human rights record consistently put North Korea at the bottom or close to the bottom. Uh, reports come out periodically. There was a recent report uh, study that was done by the World Health Organization, International Labor Organization, looking at the consequences of workplace uh, uh, accidents and, uh, and uh, injury, and the conclusion was not only was North Korea one of the worst country in the world in terms of its uh, uh, loss of uh, of life and and loss of uh, and harm, uh, but that its record is getting worse, not better. Uh, and so the idea is to look at this question of of can we work on on these issues and and find ways that human rights and nuclear security can make progress together. One of the things that we are not doing, and we consciously tried to avoid that, we're not trying to uh, catalog the uh, human rights abuses of North Korea. This is something that's done uh, by a number of uh, NGOs, non-government organizations that periodically report and give details of what's going on in North Korea. Uh, the best example, uh, the best uh, study of this issue of North Korea's human rights record uh, was a commission of inquiry that was uh, established by the UN Human Rights Council, uh, headed by uh, uh, Justice Michael Kirby. Uh, the report, which was published in 2014, is one of the best and most detailed discussions of North Korea's human rights record. 
we were fortunate to have Michael Kirby participate in the conference, and he has written one of the chapters in the book, which talks about the problems of, of North Korea's uh, human rights record, but also on the kind of progress that can be made uh, pressing North Korea on human rights uh, in other areas as well. Uh, through the United Nations. One of the participants in the con uh, conference and one of the authors of a chapter in the book is Ambassador Jun uh, Oh, the South Korean ambassador to uh, the United Nations in New York, who was a participant in the first discussion in the UN Security Council in December of uh, 2014, uh, talking about North Korea's human rights record and how it was a threat to peace and security, and the issue was therefore taken up by the Security Council. Uh, Peter Yo of the UN Foundation uh, has a chapter in the book and made, uh, made an excellent presentation on issues of uh, you, the participation in the UN Human Rights Council, uh, Special Rapporteur, the UN General Assembly, and the role that the United Nations can play in terms of encouraging uh, North Korea to move in a more positive direction. One of the uh, issues that we also spent some time talking about in the conference and in the book were issues of, of information and the important role of information in dealing with uh, issues related to uh, uh, North Korea human rights and, and also issues related to North Korean security uh, and security policy. Uh, Nat Kretchen, who's here today, is going to uh, wrote one of the chapters that discuss this issue, and he'll talk about some of these uh, these issues in his presentation. Uh, Martin Williams was was a participant and also wrote a, a good chapter that talks about these issues. And we uh, had Min Jung Kim participate in the conference, and she talked about the role of uh, South Korean non-government organizations and the importance that they play uh, in this process. So all of these these issues with, with regard to information are particularly important. Uh, Victor's chapter, which is one of the excellent chapters, uh, talks about this issue of how do you balance security on one hand and human rights on the other, and how you can turn it into uh, a non-zero-sum uh, process of, of dealing with that. Uh, so my sense is the uh, the book, uh, which is based on the uh, the chapters, the presentations that were made during our conference, does an excellent job of covering the range of issues that we need to deal with in terms of looking at North Korea human rights, but also looks at it in the context that, that this is not a, a contest uh, between security and human rights, and that one has to give if the other is to make progress. And I think that's that's the important part of the message that uh, that we wanted to, wanted to make in in terms of this presentation. Uh, a couple of other uh, presentations that are included in the book. Uh, Sean King uh, talks about the uh, comparison of North Korea and East Germany and what has happened in East Germany and how that relates to what might happen or could happen in North Korea. And uh, the final chapter is a, a, an excellent piece by uh, Thomas Fingar, who uh, was uh, a U.S. government uh, intelligence and analysis uh, specialist at highest levels of the U.S. government for a long period of time before he uh, went to his reward and was able to go to Stanford, where he is uh, now involved in projects there. But uh, Tom's uh, Tom's comments are, are particularly useful in terms of of looking at the issue that we're trying to get our hands around. But uh, thanks very much for having this conference. Thanks very much for the contributions that all of you have made to it. And I look forward to your comments and uh, the discussion. Okay, thanks, Bob, uh, for excellent uh, overview of the book. Uh, I think the book has, uh, I think, 11 chapters, and once again, covering uh, many different issues. And we are expecting to have, you know, hard copy right now today, but it's a little delayed. 
uh, just like other supply chain uh, problems. But uh, we should have in print, uh, you know, very soon. So hopefully, uh, you can buy a copy uh, when it's available. So now uh, let me turn to Ned Gretchen, uh, who also wrote a uh, excellent chapter uh, for the book. Uh, so Ned. Uh, thanks so much. Um, <clears throat> uh, thanks to Stanford, to CSIS, to Dr. Shen, uh, Dr. Cha, Ambassador King. Fabulous to be with you all. Um, I will be very brief in the hopes of reserving a bit more time for questions and encouraging folks to uh, give the book a read when these supply chain problems are, are resolved. Um, I think access to information and freedom of expression hold a somewhat distinctive space conceptually in our discussions of human rights generally and in North Korea in particular, um, which I think uh, jives well with the, the framing of, of the, the conundrum, as it were, in, in this, this book. Um, uh, access to information, freedom of speech is, of course, uh, per Article 19 of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, uh, a human right in and of itself uh, that should be protected. Um, Access to information is also a necessary component for discourse around other fundamental human rights, such that censorship and surveillance can mediate or inhibit pursuit of, of other vital human rights as well. Um, also, I think kind of interestingly, due to the, the incorporeal, the kind of ephemeral nature of information and speech, it's a right that is unique in the modern age, at least, in its ability to be directly affected across borders, uh, even without a governing regime's consent. Uh, for example, an actor, an outside actor, has a far greater ability to improve access to information uh, for an otherwise deprived people by sending in information than would be possible for, say, an outside actor trying to contend with uh, domestic restrictions on Article 13's right to movement, for instance. Um, in this space, geographic borders are not as completely limiting as they might be for other issues, and the issue can both be dealt with conceptually, but also uh, in a quite practical way. Um, so the chapters in this book that address access to information reflect that complex practical interrelation of information seekers in North Korea, those outside the country attempting to facilitate their access, um, and the North Korean state's quickly modernizing attempts to control its citizens' access to really a variety of forms of information. Um, and from my perspective, this could not be a more timely discussion as I really think we're in the midst of a pretty fundamental shift in North Korean authorities' approach to information controls, which I think in turn portends a pretty significant change in the information environment more broadly, uh, and will thus demand some new approaches from uh, those who are advocating for greater information access in North Korea. Um, in the, the smallest of nutshells, uh, I think North Korean authorities are constructing a pretty globally unique marriage of sophisticated digital censorship and surveillance capabilities uh, and their more traditional isolationist leanings. Um, they're learning lessons from more advanced digital authoritarians about how to conduct technologically enabled censorship and surveillance at scale, um, while simultaneously making practically none of the concessions to global interconnectivity and international commerce that most other modern digital authoritarian regimes must kind of balance. Um, and yet this approach, it's still built on the back of modern ICT devices such as phones and tablets, um, which also introduce into the North Korean context new speeds and a geographic dispersion of communications that has just really never been experienced by ordinary citizens uh, prior to the very recent past. Uh, so I think th all that in practice means that, that North Korean citizens attempting to access or share information find themselves between generations of technology and governance. Uh, legacy broadcast technologies, which are limited in the functionality and availability, um, but hard for authorities to block and control. And then on the other hand, modern network technologies that open up new avenues for connection and communication um, while ushering in what's really a, a new age of censorship and surveillance, even in the North Korean context. Um, further, I think while North Korean people have far more agency than is often reflected um, in coverage of these issues uh, in kind of popular media, um, and they really do display amazing ingenuity in achieving some measure of access to, to information despite the challenges, um, their ability to do so is pretty substantially influenced by outside actors attempting to provide uh, unsanctioned information and also by authorities' attempts to limit such access.
Um, so in in the book we're discussing today, Min Jung Kim's chapter on NGOs efforts to provide outside information uh, to North Korean citizens really helpfully chronicles the evolution of such efforts over the last couple of decades, and I think serves as a really important reminder of the diversity of these efforts um, embodied in their kind of different theories of change, uh, as well as the informational content and technical means of inf information delivery that they pursue. Um, it's really We've seen a variety of approaches pursued across the years, um, and I think we we often fail to reflect that diversity when we think about information, uh, you know, access efforts into North Korea narrowly. Um, her section on essentially the extremely challenging operating environment for many uh, NGOs under the current South Korean administration, I think, is worth some attention as well, as it highlights an important reality. While, as I mentioned earlier, broadcast technologies and digital media allow information freedom advocates to address important informational gaps without having to fully contend with domestic information restrictions in North Korea, complications in the operating environment in key third countries are really vital for the success of such efforts. So we have to pay attention to all of the kind of regional players to understand that, that full ecosystem. Um, and then on the other side of the coin, um, Martin Williams' chapter is, is a compellingly holistic look at many of the levers of control North Korean authorities have to limit not only the act of access uh, or sharing of unsanctioned materials, but for guarding against, I think, any potential activation of what might be used through, uh, learned through foreign media, rather. Um, he groups these levers into three broad categories, legal, ideological, and technical responses to the influx of, of outside media. And in doing so, he reminds us that even as the state has adopted new tactics of control, it remains really adept at wielding many of its more traditional means. Um, you know, just because uh, they've written a few new tunes, they have have not retired the greatest hits, as it were. Um, and his wide-angled approach, I think, is is particularly relevant in light of what we've seen as these really prolonged COVID border closures. Um, so, where does that leave us? Um, creatively thinking about new ways to use old technologies to help with, with freedom of expression in North Korea, catalyzing what we see as kind of a natural sociological evolution with the presence of these new digital tools, trying to figure out ways to undermine the most coercive forms of control on North Korean networks, creating new channels of information dissemination in. Um, these, I think, are all up for, for debate. Um, and I think while none of these chapters offers easy answers to the challenges of information access in North Korea. They do chronicle the state of play in a way that facilitates the search for these new approaches um, that also recognizes the dynamic situation on the ground inside of the country. Um, and so I will, uh, I'll leave it there. Thanks a lot. Okay, thanks, Ned. Uh, you raised a lot of uh, uh, important, uh, interesting questions. So we'll come back to some of them. So now let me turn to, you know, Victor. Uh, about your chapter and some other issues that you want to comment on? Sure, thank you. Um, so first, let me also thank uh, Professor Shen and Ambassador King for leading this project. Um, I thought it was a great project, very um, uh, policy focused, but also academically strong. Uh, and as Professor Shen said, the, uh, the volume that's about to come out any minute now is um, uh, it was based on a conference that we had done earlier, and and I was able to gather some of my thoughts on this while I was a current fellow at Stanford in the in the fall, in the winter quarter of 2019-2020. So I'm quite grateful for that opportunity, and I'm glad that CSIS and Stanford A Park Korea program could partner on on today's today's event. Um, so. I think I, you know, I really do think that this volume is quite important, and its timing is quite important because uh, North Korea policy never goes away. Um, it just continues to recreate itself with every new administration, and you have a, an administration in the United States and the Biden administration that's, you know, struggling with its own uh, conception of how it should think about the North Korea issue. Um, and I think this volume is important because. It really does try to uh, break the conventional policy wisdom that has prevailed um, on both sides of the Pacific with regard to um, two issues that matter very dearly for U.S. 
uh, national interest. That is, you know, freedom and liberty and uh, the respect for every, the integrity of every individual inherent in their right to be, uh, you know, a freestanding human being, as well as national security issues in terms of one of the most pro proximate and prominent uh, security threats today to the United States. And as Ambassador King stated, for the longest time, um, uh, we have not been able to um, carry those two ideas in our heads at the same time when dealing with North Korea. Um, you know, it has, as, as Ambassador King said, if, if we pursue the security angle, it's at the expense of human rights, or if we pursue the human rights angle, it's at the expense of security. Another way of putting that um, in terms of policy is that where we, when we're in negotiations over North Korea's nuclear program, we tend to um, not want to talk about the human rights issue because it becomes awkward or it's seen as, you know, it's seen as um, something that could pose an obstacle or slow down uh, the ongoing nuclear negotiations. Um, and it's only when we're not talking to North Korea that we feel more at liberty to uh, to speak uh, about the about the human about the human rights issues. This is nowhere is this more this point more clear than in Ambassador King's chapter, where he actually cites in the 2017 State of the Union speech how many references that President Trump made to North Korean human rights. Uh, which were numerous um, at a time when uh, we were not engaged in negotiations, uh, security negotiations with them. Uh, but as soon as we be became engaged in, in security negotiations with them, with the Singapore summit and the love letters that went back and forth between Trump and Kim Jong-un, we later learned, um, uh, there's hardly ever, there's virtually no mention of human rights in the 2018 State of the Union speech. So you could not find a more stark and obvious contrast that really, uh, it was a, a real world proximate example of this zero sum trade off the conventional wisdom. Um, and so um, my, uh, my chapter, what I did was to try to take that as the entry point to a discussion that really questioned whether we should continue to abide the, by that conventional wisdom by asking the question, well, you know, we have followed this path of um, pursuing security at the expense of human rights or vice versa. Um, and, uh, you know, the the the, um, the best test of whether that particular model has worked is to ask, well, what are the results? Right. And the results, have, you know, as we all know, have not been very positive. We have not talked about human rights in our discussions with North Korea. But, uh, you know, I would argue it has not made, we, we have not had considerable advances in our denuclearization negotiations with North Korea by ignoring human rights. Um, one could argue uh, that it might not have gone, it would have gone even less farther than it did if we had included human rights. Uh, but uh, either way, it's a suboptimal outcome, whether it was, you know, the, the, um, the uh, counterfactual that we would have been worse off or where we are today, the difference is between being worse off and really worse off. We're still worse off. Um, so it's not really working. And so what um, we talked about in the conference and in the volume and what I tried to do in my chapter was to say, practically speaking, how should we think about connecting the human rights agenda and the denuclearization agenda? And in, uh, in my chapter, I said there are essentially four ways of do, four ways we should think about uh, think about this. Uh, the first is that um, it's the right thing to do, right? The United States as a country, South Korea as uh, as a liberal democracy, uh, should raise human rights if uh, in discussions with North Korea because it's the right thing to do. Um, uh, because there is, uh, as the COI report uh, documents and is everyone here knows there are horrible human rights abuses in North Korea and um, uh, it is incumbent upon the United States and countries like South Korea, leading democracies in the world to say something about human rights. So one, it's the right thing to do. Second, um, if one of the goals of our 
strategy with North Korea is eventually to get to a point where we recognize each other formally as nation states, U.S. DPRK normalization. It's inconceivable to me that that outcome could be pursued, let alone achieved, without having some sort of human rights dialogue with North Korea. Um, yes, the United States in the past has worked with, you know, less than stellar regimes, but um, in terms of the the objectives and the ambitions of, of North Korea's strategy, has, as they have been laid out by successive administrations going back to 1994, normalization has been one of the endpoints of this. And so um, it's impossible really to think about normalizing relations with 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 North Korea without there be some without there being some addressing of the human rights issues. Um, third, um, uh, combining the human rights and denuclearization agenda is politically smart. Um, we're living in a day both in South Korea and the United States of great political polarization. Uh, but there is there are very few issues that gain bipartisan support in the US Congress. Uh, but this is one of them, right? North Korean human rights. This is one of them. When Bob King was the envoy, he had, uh, you know, unqualified bi bipartisan support for his mission. Um, the North Korean Human Rights Act has passed and, pa and been renewed in Congress with overwhelming bipartisan support. Um, um, it is the politically smart thing to do. And if any administra U.S. administration were to negotiate denuclearization and normalization with North Korea without addressing the human rights issue, you can be certain that they would face a lot of questions in Congress about why the human rights issue wasn't addressed. So third, it's a politically smart thing to do. And then fourth, um, you know, one, the, the core, I would argue that the core transaction in, uh, in the U.S. agreements with North Korea, the past U.S. agreements with North Korea, on their nuclear program um, is a you know is a basic quid pro quo where North Korea would disarm in return for entree to the international community and in particular the lifting of sanctions and economic rejuvenation of the country, plugging them into the most you know the most economically dynamic and prosperous region of the world today you know which they are not connected to. Um, uh, in 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 Trump's language, he talked about this as casinos in one song, uh, which is, you know, it's a pretty simplistic interpretation, but it gets at the, at the heart of what um, is on offer to North Korea, and that is connecting with the international community in return for uh, giving up these weapons of mass destruction. Well, it, it may not seem like it, but human rights is a very important part of that, because um, even if the president of the United States were to say so, uh, existing U.S. law and U.N. Security Council sanctions makes it very difficult for private sector to engage with North Korea as long as there are these human rights abuses inside the country. Um, so ironically, the United States or South Korea uh, or others raising the human rights issue um, is, is actually, a, it's actually credible signaling, right, to use international relations, it's credible signaling because it means that we are really committed to providing the economic support to North Korea um, um, because we want some of these human rights issues, uh, issues addressed such that we can legally do that or such that the private sector can legally uh, um, uh, bring capital, bring uh, enterprise to North Korea. So um, these things are not at all disconnected. They're actually, human rights is actually integral to the U.S. strategy on North Korea, um, and so you know, again, I, I think that that's why this volume is particularly important at, at at this time in my chapter. I also talk about the distinction between humanitarian assistance and human rights. Um, th this is a particularly relevant question today, given the COVID situation. Well, the border shutdown because of the COVID situation in North Korea, which has created a very dire economic situation uh, inside the country and has raised a lot of questions about whether uh, humanitarian assistance should be on the table for discussion uh, for discussion with North, with North Korea. And then finally, the last thing I'll say is that um, 
aside from the humanitarian assistance side, on the human rights side, um, the, the most important and positive force for improvement of the human condition in North Korea uh, has been the growth of markets. Um, and I talk about a little bit about this at the end of my chapter. It is the one thing that has really improved the lives of North Koreans, improved the human condition in North Korea. In North Korea, and more importantly, as Nate suggested, has been has been uh, the funnel through which they have been able to gain access to information um, and given them hope in terms of having the ability on their own to improve their own lives. And that's probably the most important human right that we can give to the North Korean people. Um, so with that, again, I want to congratulate um, Professor Shin and Ambassador King on this great volume. Uh, I hope all of our viewers. Uh, get a chance to read the book because I think it's really uh, it's really very important work. Back to you. Okay, thanks, uh, Victor, uh, for a great presentation. So before uh, I start our conversation, uh, once again, send your question on our event page, and then we'll try to uh, address as much as possible. Uh, and also, as some of you may know, uh, Bob King wrote a book uh, by himself. <laughs> Uh, patterns of impunity, uh, human rights in North Korea, and the, the, the role of the special envoy, U.S. special envoy. So, so he began writing uh, this book uh, when he was fellow at our center. It's a great book. So, uh, please, it's kind of companion. So, with his book and then this uh, this volume. So, please read uh, both of them. Okay, let me uh, start with some maybe uh, question about your experience in the government uh, for Bob and and, and, and Victor. And here we are trying to, you know, raise questions about how to balance, you know, between human rights and uh, nuclear security in dealing with North Korea. And you know, Bob, you more uh, dealt with or focused on human rights issue, and Victor, I guess uh, you are more on security in dealing with uh, North Korea. And I don't think you overlap, but still. Uh, in the government, uh, among agency, I mean, do you really talk to each other? Or, or so I just like to get a sense of uh, what it's like uh, in the government. Uh, now, you're not working uh, anymore at this point, so you can be more honest. But then I'm sure some may say, oh, you know, human rights uh, is important, but then let's uh, set aside for a while. Let's focus on nuclear issues. So, you know, what's it like a uh, discussion among agencies in the government? So maybe real time kind of uh, <laughs> uh, picture of kind of conversations or debate. You want to start, Victor, or do you want me to no, start? Please, you go ahead. <laughs> uh, this was a real concern, I think, with the people who were involved in uh, appointing me. Uh, it was required by law, the House and Senate had adopted legislation. There was to be a special envoy with rank of ambassador, specific instructions as to what was to be done. And so I think there was some concern about uh, this with the uh, Obama administration when uh, Hillary Clinton came in as, uh, as Secretary of State. Uh, one thing that put additional pressure on, the, uh, uh, on Clinton was that ambassadorships were being held up by uh, then Senator uh, Sam Brownback until he got assurance that a special envoy for North Korea human rights issues would be appointed. And uh, the assistant secretary of state was held up by Brownback uh, until uh, Clinton gave him assurances that there would be somebody in place. Uh, so there, there was, uh, the congressional factor was an important element here in terms of encouraging that. Uh, the other thing was, there was a real commitment on the part of, of Secretary Clinton on, on other officials in the State Department uh, that human rights would need to be a part of our pro policy towards North Korea, and we needed to do this. Uh, so it was uh, there was a sense that it was a good idea. The thing that was probably of concern is to have uh, a human rights envoy who wasn't uh, wasn't plugged in. And being a full-time member uh, of the staff, being in Washington, uh, I was put in with the group of people who were dealing with 
the nuclear issues, uh, as well as the day-to-day -day issues of North Korea and South Korea, so that we were dealing with all of these issues with the same group of people. I spent more time uh, in the State Department uh, dealing with the Human Rights Bureau and with uh, people concerned about information and that kind of thing. But nonetheless, my office was right next door to uh, Steve Bosworth and uh, Glenn Davies, uh, who were negotiating or trying to negotiate with the North Koreans on the nuclear issue. We kept each other informed. We talked about it. We, uh, we worked together. Uh, Bosworth made a point of making sure that I was invited to uh, meetings that took place. Uh, when the North Koreans uh, sent uh, the uh, deputy foreign minister uh, to the United States and had conversations here, I was part of the lunch where we discussed some of these issues. We had a good conversation and it was a very useful conversation. So I think there was, there was an effort to structure it in a way that it was helpful. And I think that's an important part of the process. Uh, I think with the Trump administration, there was no interest in doing this and there was more concern than anything. And the result was no official was ever appointed as, as special envoy for North Korea human rights issues. But I think that it does need to be part of an integrated process and it works much better if it is. Uh, yeah, I would, yeah I, so I would certainly agree with that. So in, in um, I, I worked with Bob King's predecessor, uh, who was the first uh, first appointed senior uh, special envoy for human rights, Jay Lefkowitz, uh, who took on the position um, and um, uh, and was was doing it from New York because he lived in New York uh, and was coming to Washington um, uh, as as needed. But um, you know, I would say that there 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 was there was a disconnect. Because you know, Ambassador Lefkowitz was trying to pu push forward on the human rights issues, and um, and we were a part, you know, were deeply involved in the six party negotiations, and there was just you know people just didn't think there was room to talk about human rights, you know, you know maybe in the context of one of the five working groups of the six party agreement which was usdprk bilateral relations bilateral normalization theoretically it could be talked about there uh, but it really wasn't it, it it was um very much a part of this conventional wisdom and i was a part of it you know where we said that like, we can't talk about this now because the the relationship is really bad now having said that we had a president right president george w bush who was very passionately concerned about human rights. And see, so he, on his own, um, using the Oval Office, uh, waged his own human rights campaign <laughs> um, that included signing into law the first um, um, uh, North Korean defector resettlement program in the United States, for the first time bringing North Korean defectors into the Oval Office for meetings and conversations. Um, and so we had this very interesting combination where we had the envoy um, who was, you know, not a part of the nuclear negotiations, um, but who was great, very much in sync with the president, like the top boss, who had very strong views on not just in North Korea, but human rights more broadly. The, the thing I remember the most, however, was... Um, um, I think when Ambassador King went to the region to talk to allies and partners about human rights, you know, he was able to do that pretty effectively. Um, but at the time, um, our envoy at the time, Mr. Lefkowitz, had a very difficult time when he went to the region and, and even when he went to South Korea, because the South Korean government, also very focused on engagement with North Korea, didn't want to talk about the human rights issues. Um, this was the Nomi Hyun government. Didn't didn't really want to talk about. Found it very awkward to talk about the human rights issues, um, and 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 I remember there were occasions where we implored the government that they must uh, take meetings with our envoy because uh, um, because it was important for them to do so. But uh, but um, so it was. I I do remember that when um, Ambassador King was there. I remember the the suite of offices that. I think the four of you had, it was you and then 
the special envoy for North Korea, this, the envoy for nuclear, uh, for six party talks, and then the envoy for sanctions. I think there were four of you in that, in that office. And so that, you know, in governments, uh, uh, you know, uh, office space and where you sit, and it means a lot. And the fact that they had the four of them together was a sign that they were making an effort at, poli at policy integration. Okay, thank you. So I'll come back to uh, this issue uh, a little later, but let me turn to Annette uh, for your insights. Um, you know, as you know, uh, there was a controversy when uh, South Korean government uh, banned uh, sending leaflets uh, into the north. And I think there are two questions. One was, uh, was sending leaflets really effective? in sending information to North Korea. I mean, you mentioned the importance of uh, you know, inflow information to North Korea. So was it really effective? And number two, uh, South Korean government uh, said that, uh, I mean, there's a complaint from Pyongyang, right? And then in order to uh, improve uh, relations with uh, North Korea, I mean, they had to listen to them and they banned. So was it really effective also in uh, containing uh, you know, information inflow into North Korea? So I think in a sense, uh, were both really effective or both were more political gestures? So what's your assessment? Uh, you definitely have thrown me the, the sticky wicket of, uh, of information questions, uh, <laughs> Dr. Shen. Um, I would say in general, uh, it's probably best to piece apart some of the, the sub-issues there. Um, on the one hand, like, uh, you know, we have conducted surveys for many years of North Korea. It's hard to find evidence of broad impact of balloon campaigns. Um, you know, there are certainly anecdotal evidence of localized impact, but, um, you know, when you compare it to some other uh, forms of information dissemination into North Korea, um, it's, uh, it is it is probably less broadly effective, um, you know, if you compare it to to broadcast um, and and other kind of more broad based uh, approaches. Um, that said, I think an interesting dynamic that that un unveils is one that we saw say around uh, South Korean like military loudspeaker broadcasts. Is that there is an element of kind of public display that sometimes gets conflated with the efficacy of an approach to information. Uh, dissemination, which um, can kind of cut both ways. On the one hand, um, you know, loudspeakers on the border, uh, probably less broadly impactful than ongoing radio broadcasts that you know can reach the entire population or hyper compelling South Korean dramas coming in through through other means. And yet that was a really important symbolic thing as a kind of back and forth between the two governments um, that they were negotiating over. So I think the uh, the thing that, that we were worried about with the South Korean government in the legislation around balloons, at least from my perspective, was less the balloon issue specifically and more um, the willingness to crack down on uh, on essentially these kind of efforts and show that this is an open society in which civil society should have the ability to uh, you know, within limits, conduct this kind of advocacy. Um, so I think that that was whether there needed to be kind of specific limitations put around specific activities or not. Um, the the seeming reluctance to show a vibrant civil society that was reflecting uh, a wish to, to send information in, I think, was the the most concerning part of that episode, at least from my perspective. Mm. Okay, thank you. I think there are some, uh, you know, questions from the audience about the impact of COVID-19 uh, on North Korea. I think this question to any of the panelists. Um, so do you have any good sense of uh, the current situation uh, in North Korea? I mean, now we are entering almost two full years uh, since pandemic uh, began. And, you know, many of, you know, people in the world that uh, they're suffering and it's not uh, it's not hard to imagine that uh, there are a lot of uh, North Koreans are suffering, right? So uh, I think there are two questions. One is, uh, do you know any good uh, assessment of the current situation in North Korea? 
And number two, is there anything we can do, either U.S. government or South Korean government or NGO uh, to address? I think uh, some questions saying, uh, should we increase our humanitarian support or assistance to North Korea? Or I think some one person saying, or should we press North Korea to deal with uh, violation of human rights in North Korea? So I invite any panelists to make any comments on those issues. Maybe I can, oh, go ahead, Victor, go ahead. No, no, you go first. Uh, it's a, uh, the COVID-19 is a very interesting case study of how North Korea deals with issues. Uh, first of all, they've denied it. Uh, they deny that there are any North Koreans that have been afflicted by COVID-19. Uh, they've shut the borders. They've stopped virtually most trade going in and out of North Korea. Uh, there are stories coming out of North Korea of uh, Russian diplomats wanting to return to Russia and having to push their own luggage on rail carts across the, the bridge over the Tumen River to get to uh, Russia because of fear of, of the COVID. Uh, the North Korean government continues to deny that there are any COVID cases in the country. Uh, they have reported this officially to the UN. Uh, it's hard to believe that, uh, that that's the case. On the other hand, North Korea does manage to keep itself so tightly isolated, and that has increased uh, in this era uh, to make it very, uh, you know, it is possible that, uh, that things are kept under control simply because people are forced to stop having contact. Uh, I think it's more uh, an indication of the ability of the North Korean regime to force its population into, you know, lack of contact. Uh, but what this means in the long run is hard to tell. I think there is definitely a role for the United States and for other countries to play in terms of dealing with North Korea on humanitarian issues like COVID-19 and other such things. Uh, it would be useful and helpful to provide uh, medicines and vaccines and, and, and other kinds of technical help to North Korea, and we ought to be doing some of that. This ought to be something done through, uh, you know, uh, individual governments when they've got large programs there can mount large programs as the U.S., South Korea can do, uh, but through U.N. agencies when there are other uh, countries that can and, and should be involved. And I think when we're talking about this humanitarian assistance, uh, it's something that, that really goes beyond the politics. The difficulty is that when you're providing humanitarian assistance, you want to make sure that the decision is based on humanitarian needs, not on seeing that those who are in most in highest leadership levels uh, are the ones who get the benefits. And for the United States, we can provide assistance, but by law, we are required to assure that the distribution of assistance we provide is monitored so that those who are most in need are the ones that receive it. Uh, which means it doesn't go just to the uh, members of the Central Committee first and then down the, the pecking order. So there are issues that, uh, that are complicated, but nonetheless, it's the kind of thing that we ought to be engaged in. There are a number of American NGOs that do really good humanitarian work in North mm -hmm. Korea. We need to provide help and assistance to them uh, and uh, do what we can. Right now, it's difficult to get into North Korea, and I'm not sure there's a lot that can be done, but there should be some effort made to try to reach out in some of these areas. Okay, Victor on that. Yeah, so I would I would add a couple of points. The um, first, yes, this you know the this border has been closed since January of 2020, so we are rapidly approaching two years um, of North Korea having really no contact with the with the outside world and no contact with uh, or virtually no contact with its most important trading partner in the world and that is china so um, irregardless of whether there is transmission in the country or not the steps they've taken to try to prevent and minimize the risk to covid 
have had devastating economic consequences uh, for for the country, and and um, it, it's been actually much more resilient than I expected it could be. But I think now we're starting to hear more and more about about price increases, about shortages of basic materials, uh, about um, energy shortages, food shortages. The situation does appear to be uh, quite uh, quite acute. Um, we're actually working on a report right now, a satellite imagery report that um, are looking at some of the efforts that North Korea is undertaking to try to reopen the border, um, um, which include uh, the building of um, effectively cargo quarantine facilities on the border um, in order to try to, you know, bring in cargo and quarantine it uh, and try to, in that way, open to trade. There have been unexplained delays in terms of this. Um, they, they started this at about the one year mark of when the border has been closed, uh, but there are some unexplained delays. Um, but still, that you know, that is not going to completely alleviate their problem. It's going to far from alleviate their problem, and th this will continue to be um, a, a major issue. In, in terms of international support and vaccine, you know, North Korea applied successfully to Covax to to receive the to be on the list to receive the vaccines. There was a delay uh, over the summer just because of the global supply shortage of vaccines. Um, but the uh, amazing thing now is that, uh, according to reports, they have rejected, at least on three different instances, the provision of a, a Chinese vaccine, the provision of, a, of the Russian vaccine, and the provision of AstraZeneca. Um, um, and, and nobody knows exactly why that's the case. I have my own theories or uh, explanations for that. but. Um, uh, but that also is puzzling, that a country that has mm -hmm. really put itself in a very difficult position because of, you know, deathly fears that the virus raging through the country, they don't have a health system or the capability to deal with it. And yet they are rejecting these offers of vaccines from the, um, from the, from the international community. Um, so as Bob said, there, you know, the, there is a humanitarian need here. And um, whether it's the international community, the United States, or South Korea, or others, uh, it's important that that humanitarian assistance uh, sort of meet the norms and standards for how humanitarian assistance is executed in countries like this. And that, you know, if somebody gives them vaccines, they just don't, they're supposed to vaccine, vaccinate the most vulnerable, mm -hmm. not the most privileged first. And, um, and, uh, and you know we can't we can never be sure of that with North Korea. So it is it is a case for humanitarian assistance, but it has to be done the right way. Uh, that's yeah. One small addition to that um, is <clears throat> simply kind of to note an interesting, I think, uh, catalyzation because of the the border closure of a trend that we have already seen. Um, you know. In terms of information flow in North Korea, the Chinese border has always essentially been the corridor to all sorts of information and trade. Um, in the wake of the arduous march, um, that was really done at a low level with individuals kind of crossing at their, their own volition. Um, since then, I think there's been a pretty steady and ongoing retrenchment to uh, more constricted channels of movement back and forth. Forth, which is something that I think the North Korean authorities have uh, made pretty concerted efforts to securitize the border and to limit those flows to essentially pre-approved channels. Um, I would expect that, you know, despite the fact that they certainly want to open some channels up for uh, for kind of the economic need, they will be doing so in a way that is very security conscious and it tries to, to not essentially give up some of the uh, you know, control gains that they have received by by shutting down the border as completely as they have in the in the COVID period. OK, so there are so many questions uh, from the audience, but uh, let me uh, come back to this human rights and uh, nuclear security issues. And I think question is saying uh, you guys made very compelling points uh, as to why uh, both human rights and nuclear security must be discussed uh, together. But then what are really practical steps or ways to achieve that objective? Because 
uh, I think dealing with uh, a nuclear security issue alone is very challenging. I mean, you know, we have seen over the last uh, three decades. And also, North Korea will uh, take a uh, raging human rights issue as a way of undermining uh, the regime. So what are practical uh, steps to achieve that? And more specifically, this is uh, from my colleague, uh, Sig Hacker. How does one divide the public uh, versus private push for human rights issues during the nuclear negotiations? So these are tough questions, but I still like to get your insight. Um, so let me let me try. For, um, first, I would say that um, there's no denying that it's hard. Right? Uh, when you've been doing things one way for a long time, arguably for decades, it's it's hard to switch. Right? And um, and so, and so it would be difficult, it's difficult for the foreign policy establishment to say, okay, now we're going to uh, um, include North Korea as another issue in the agenda. From a negotiator's perspective, it would essentially be saying, okay, my job is hard enough as it is, and now right. you want to make it even harder. <laughs> right. By allowing the North Koreans to say, now you're not just putting up one goalpost, you're putting up two goalposts, and you're moving them at the same time, right? As we're as we're doing the negotiation. Um, but I think one of the responses there is, um, you know, again, I think as as um, you know, people have written in the past, um, especially with distrustful negotiation counterparts like the U.S. and North Korea, it's all about credible signaling, right? Mm -hmm. So. Um, if the North Koreans were to take steps on human rights, and this could be done in a private conversation, as one of the questions mentioned, as opposed to a public shaming conversation, but if they were to take steps on human rights, that would be something different that we have not seen be before, and even among skeptics would raise eyebrows as to, as to saying, well, you know, this looks a little bit different. Frankly, if the Biden administration got into another negotiation where we traded heavy fuel oil for a freeze of operations at the Yongbyon nuclear reactor, like how many people would believe that that's credible, right? Because it's been broken several times already. Like nobody's going to believe that that's credible. Um, uh, but if we see something different, like a dialogue on human rights, um, um, uh, like a serious dialogue on what human rights steps would lead to lifting of some U, um, um, of UN sanctions or US law related to human rights, right? I mean, that, you know, that would be a, a different and much more credible and potentially fruitful area of negotiation that could have positive spillover effects for credibility in the nuclear, in the nuclear negotiation. It's not easy, uh, no way is it easy. Uh, it would require authorization at the top because remove, starting to remove some of these sanctions even on human rights, um, you know, will you know may require executive orders uh, for something like that to happen. Um, um, but uh, you know, I think our point is that what we're doing thus far hasn't really worked, and and um, this is an issue that matters or should matter for. U.S. policymakers and for the American people, and for South Korean policymakers and the South Korean people, uh, and so we're we're just saying you should you sh you need to look at this and consider it. Still, the government in South Korea and the Biden administration today do not have human rights envoys for North Korea. Mm -hmm. I mean, still doesn't. There has been no successor to Ambassador King now for well over five years, over two administrations. So. Uh, Bob or Nett? Can I add a couple of comments? Uh, first of all, on this, uh, uh, how do you integrate? Uh, how do you push human rights at the same time you're trying to make progress on security issues? It seems to me that there are a couple of things that you can do on the human rights side. Uh, one is to focus on some of the human rights issues that are less sensitive. Uh, one of the things that the North Koreans have actually made progress on uh, is in the area of human rights for people with disabilities. 
And uh, there are things that we could do in terms of encouraging that and recognizing that that would help build a better relationship to go on to other issues. And I think that's something that's worth doing and, and worth uh, uh, trying to deal with. Uh, humanitarian aid is an area where I think there's room for for progress. Uh, there are things that we can do and should do. One of the things that was particularly disappointing uh, was the decision that was made in 2017 to uh, exclude all travel to North Koreans uh, to North Korea by American citizens, with the exception of journalists who were going in a specific journalistic capacity. Uh, that I think was particularly harmful because there are a number of American NGOs, uh, private groups that have been involved and engaged with North Korea, and they've made real progress in terms of uh, opening up uh, channels of information. Uh, so that if if there were some effort to uh, you know adjust san sanctions to take this into account. Uh, I think these, that would be a, a helpful step, a, a helpful progress. Uh, on the other hand, one has to keep in mind the North Koreans are very difficult to deal with. It's not like if you offer them aid, they're going to say, yes, thank you. We'd love to have you here, as evidenced by the fact that they've turned down vaccines that have been offered them. Uh, it's not going to be an easy project. Uh, uh, and certainly uh, negotiating on nuclear issues has not been an easy project. Uh, dealing with the North Koreans on the human rights issues is not going to be an easy one. Uh, Sig Hegert mentioned this uh, question of public and private efforts. It seems to me that one of the things the U.S. government ought to do is encourage private efforts, encourage uh, NGOs that are engaged in uh, medical and educational and other kinds of projects in North Korea. We ought to do everything we can to encourage it. I think there's less interest in encouraging American runners who want to go so they can say they've uh, run in the Pyongyang uh, Marathon. Uh, but there are things like that that we can do that would move us in the right direction. I think we should do it, and I think there's uh, value in, in doing it. And I agree, uh, Victor's comments were particularly good in terms of some of the areas where we can cooperate. Thanks. So Ned, uh, any comments to add? Uh, not much to add other than to say in kind of uh, my own more narrow corner of the issue, I would definitely co-sign essentially what was implicit in both Victor and, uh, and, and Bob's comments in terms of like allowing for more bottom-up participation. Um, I think we benefit strategically in negotiations when we present a more complex hand rather than trying to control everything as tightly and as darily, um, you know, with all the, the caveats to the inherent difficulty uh, duly noted. Yeah. Yeah. So, Bob, we still appreciate uh, your strong support uh, for our engagement with North Korea in education, in a medical support, and so on. So, hopefully, uh, people can continue. So now let me uh, ask you know final question, combining uh, a lot of uh, questions from the audience. It's more like uh, moving forward. Um, you know, Victor, you mentioned that uh, there's no special envoy uh, in appointment, and actually we don't have uh, American ambassador in Seoul either. Actually, I mean <laughs> it's been a while. And then someone saying that like uh, Sun Kim, you know, is a great person for the job, but he might be part time, right? He's still in Jakarta, right? So uh, I think some people are saying that uh, does Biden administration really has any interest in dealing with uh, North Korea? Okay, so I mean that's I mean it's not really my view, but I think that's a view by you know many people, uh, including in the audience. And then uh, also working with uh, Seoul is very important. But now uh, South Korea is getting into election. And there will be election in uh, early March next year. And we don't know who's going to win. Uh, either progressive keep their power or conservative you know, you know, may come back to power. So in a sense, uh, next six months will be quite important uh, in, in, in managing. So what we need to do, let's say, at least for the next six months, uh, until uh, probably uh, we have all those appointments, uh, in a key appointment, and also possibly new government uh, in, in Seoul. 
So any ideas, any suggestions on moving forward in the next six months or so? Um, uh, let me let me try to answer those questions. So I, first, um, um, the right, the appointment process, I mean, relatively speaking, the Biden administration uh, is behind on appointments uh, compared at this time compared to previous administrations because of, because of holes that have been placed on a lot of these appointments in, in, in the Senate um, by a, a couple of Republican senators. Um, having said that, there hasn't been an ambassador named to Seoul and there hasn't been a envoy named for North Korean human rights. Um, and, and, you know, I think everybody believes that those need to happen as soon as possible. Um, in terms of the, um, uh, the road ahead, you know, you know, I think the, the, the Biden administration is not without expertise on this problem. Um, many of its officials uh, in the White House and the State Department have been involved in previous negotiations at the very highest level. And they are familiar with all of the roadblocks and the frustration and the difficulty and some would argue the futility of trying to negotiate with North Korea. Um, uh, thus far until recently, the North Koreans have not really pushed their hand because they have not done the bevy of provocations that they usually grant, greet every new U.S. president with. We haven't seen that, probably because of COVID. We haven't seen that. But we're starting to see more now. Um, and the administration will be forced eventually, sooner or later, to deal with North Korea much more upfront than sort of as a back, as a back burner issue. It, as a back burner issue. Um, you know, I think it's very challenging for our, the ambassador to one of our biggest embassies and most important countries in Southeast Asia to carry this portfolio and a fully active negotiation with North Korea. I think he's a very competent and is the institutional memory of the negotiation in the U.S. government today, but he's only one person and um, he has to sleep, right? And there are only 24 hours in a day. And so I think it's very, it's very, hard, it's very hard to do that. So they need to find, um, a, a, uh, they need to find a solution to that. Um, I think, as you know well, and as many of our listeners know well, the, um, uh, the South Korean government, the Moon government in its last few months in office, is not pressing on human rights issues with North Korea. It's pressing on an end of war declaration, um, pressing very hard on an end of war declaration. Um, you know, we can certainly discuss that. Um, that is certainly not about human rights, and it's not about denuclearization. So it's but neither of the issues that we're talking about. The question is whether an end of war de de declaration could facilitate either of those two issues. It's not clear to me that it can. I mean, I'm happy to be convinced otherwise, but it's not clear to me at this particular point that uh, that can open a discussion on denuclearization or open a discussion on human rights uh, with North Korea. Um, the last time the South Koreans had an envoy for human rights was uh, during uh, the conservative governments in South Korea. Um, my guess is if that the conservatives won, they would also uh, appoint an envoy for human rights and, and have it much more a part of their policy. Um, but <clears throat> I, I don't expect to see anything different from the Moon government on this in its remaining time in office. Um, and and I would expect um, that one of the things to look for on the human rights side in a new government, whether it's progressive or conservative, after the election in March, is whether there will be any um, reclaiming of the ground that has been lost by NGOs in their work on North Korean human rights. They have been, uh, in many ways, they have been undercut, underfunded, rolled back by the current administration uh, in Seoul and um, uh, and it, these activities have garnered international attention, um, uh, not, uh, including from from the United Nations. Um, so I think that'll be one area to watch in terms of human rights, regardless of who comes to power after the election, uh, whether some of that lost ground can be can be recouped. Okay, and then what about? Uh, I. 
I'm surprised, I'm struck by how much Victor and I agree on everything. <laughs> Republican administration, I work for a Democratic administration, but we're in the same place. Uh, the appointment of an ambassador to Seoul is, is one of the things that's really important. The problem is not the Biden administration. The problem is not Tony Blinken. The problem is Ted Cruz. Ted Cruz is sitting on 20 ambassadorships right now. Uh, he's refusing to allow them to go forward. Uh, I worked in the House of Representatives for 25 years, and so I don't want to say disparaging things about the Senate. Uh, but quite frankly, to allow one senator to do what Ted Cruz is doing shows gross incompetence on the part of some of the members of the Senate to allow that to happen. And that's what's happened with the Seoul ambassadorship. That's what's happened with the uh, special envoy for North Korea human rights issues. Uh, Tony Blinken has already indicated the administration would like to appoint someone to that position uh, and that they intend to do that. Uh, at this point, when you got uh, whatever it is, 20 ambassadorships sitting there waiting for the Senate to act on them, they've had committee hearings, they have uh, received approval, they're ready to go, but it takes uh, the Senate to say yes. Uh, in most cases, done without a formal vote, but one senator can step in and say, nope, you can't raise this issue. Uh, it's hard because that was one reason why I was appointed so qu as quickly as I was, because Brownback said, I want somebody in that position. Not the way to do business and not the way to conduct our foreign policy. Uh, but domestic politics is always a messy situation. Uh, I think that uh, the, uh, the efforts are important in terms of what's going on with human rights. And I think it's important to have people in place that can move it forward. And I hope that we'll see that happen soon. And that uh, you have the final words. Oh, final word. That's a tall order. Uh, other than to say, uh, being from the NGO side and not in government at all, I just further echo uh, Bob and Victor's comments in terms of the the outlook. I mean, certainly what is possible for uh, private civil society actors is very much uh, defined by folks in both administrations uh, in the U.S. and South Korea. I think from uh, a kind of uh, inflection point in the future of information access in North Korea, we need to be really uh, undergirding the kind of things that take effect over a long time, but also really focusing on new innovations to respond to what are really a new form of information controls. Um, and as Victor said, claw back a lot of the uh, the unfortunate losses we've seen in NGO support from South Korea. Um, and that's not going to happen effectively until we have folks in place. Okay, thank you. I think now we are uh, over the time and uh, it's great to have uh, Bob and Victor at our center and working on uh, two books and then Ned and other people uh, made a contribution. So I think it's a great collaboration uh, between Washington or DC and, and California. And I welcome more from, from Washington. Uh, today it's like blue sky 70. So you guys are welcome to come uh, to our center and our university and we'll continue our collaboration. And for that, I really appreciate uh, CSIS and Victor for co-sponsoring uh, th this event. So hopefully we can continue uh, our collaboration uh, in the coming years. Thank you so much and have a great day. And then see you again. Thank you.